Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Web Survey Design Workshop conducted by Kevin Famalant. I am Sue Boffman from ARL and very pleased to welcome our project team members from the Research Library Impact Framework Initiative and colleagues from our project libraries. It's really great that you could join us today for this workshop. If you have attended some of our earlier workshops, you've heard these comments about the framework initiative. So bear with me while I share them again. Um, our initiative has been underway for over a year now, and our teams have been very busy exploring a series of questions. These questions relate to space, diversity, equity, and inclusion, special collections, and researcher productivity. Uh, these are the issues that our teams are studying. And our goal for this initiative is to help us understand how to address some of the most pressing questions that you all are dealing with regarding value and impact. So this initiative is funded by the, an IMLS grant and we're very appreciative of that. As part of this initiative, our two consultants, Kevin Famalant and Margaret Roller, have developed a series of workshops on qualitative and quantitative research methods. Our goal for these workshops is to help library colleagues uh, develop their skills and expertise in conducting research in your libraries. And today's workshop is a part of that series. Um, so Kevin was with us on Tuesday and along with today's uh, session, we are recording both and we'll re share both recordings and Kevin's slides and other documentation uh, with everyone uh, sometime next week. You are very welcome to share these materials with colleagues who couldn't be with us today. Um, so you know, please do that. We hope you will do that. Uh, so Kevin, without any further ado, let me turn the virtual podium over to you. And thank you for being with us again today. Thanks, Sue. Um, just wanted to thank everyone for joining me today. Um, the presentation should go about an hour long um, with a brief survey exercise that's interactive that you'll get to, to play with online. So let me just share my screen here. So we'll, today we'll be talking about the principles of web survey design um, and particularly the survey structures that promote consistency in data collection. Um, so in my own survey research work, and I do a lot of surveys for healthcare research, both for compliance and also for internal quality purposes, but a lot of the um, a lot of the work that I do is, is generalizable to, to any sort of sociological survey. Um, so I work with some small custom surveys, you know, uh, five to a hundred, uh, five to a thousand people, and some larger ones where I'm uh, asking the opinions of, of millions of members of health plans. And so some of the things that I think about before I even um, before I even approach collecting data from from members or participants in the survey are, you know, what are my what's my eligible population? How can I build a survey that promotes um, the same experience for everyone? What sort of language can I use that will make participants have the same experience uh, across the entire uh, the entire sample population? Um, what can I do to reduce respondent burden? Um, even if there's and that can mean both the length of the survey, um, so the number of questions, but a survey can also seem easier if uh, through some visual um, some visual shortcuts and also just from the wording and the consistency of the language you use makes for an easier experience to fill out the survey. And since our goal is to get as many survey completes and as much feedback as we can um, from our sample, that's one of the things that we should think about when we're designing a web survey. And, um, you know, web surveys um, have a lot of advantages and I'll get into them in my presentation. But, you know, of course, it's not the only mode um, for, for which we survey respondents. Um, there's telephone surveys, written surveys, fax surveys. Um, so this is one mode that, uh, you know, is becoming, has become increasingly common. I'm sure for younger respondents, it's the main way that they interact um, with surveys. Um, so I think it's important to, to learn um, how to utilize the tools on your web survey platform um, to interact appropriately with people from all across the age spectrum and then across um, 
also also across sort of uh, language abilities is something that I encounter as well. So many of my participants there in, in, in my survey research do not speak, uh, English is not their first language. So when I'm designing my survey, I'm using consistent language um, that can be read by everyone from uh, those who are native speakers to those who are not. And um, I do want to add before I launch into some of the more technical aspects of web survey design to please feel free to interrupt me with any questions. Um, if you can, you can feel free to do so verbally. You can also use the chat. So um, for survey research, uh, we start from what are the big questions? Um, so why are we conducting this research? What kind of feedback are we interested in getting from our participants? How do we collect reliable information that we can use? And what do we want to, to know uh, to learn from our survey results? And so one, I particularly like to focus on what kind of feedback we're interested in. And that's because um, that really helps me get into designing the structures of the questions that go into the survey. Um, so if we want feedback about a specific service, we tailor our questions to ask about um, how frequent um, the respondent interacted with the service, what was the quality of that interaction. Um, part of the way that we write questions is to limit um, limit the experiences that the respondent is thinking about. So we don't want to be asking about um, for feedback from another service from something that we don't we don't administer, we don't have control over. Um, so our, our job is to prompt that uh, respondent to think only about the services that we're interested in learning about and then to uh, you know, prime them to go back into that moment and think about what their experience was and uh, not to allow other uh, not to allow other experiences to interfere with our data collection. Um, another big one, reliable, reliable information. I'll get into a little bit more in that in, in detail in the presentation. Um, and then why do we do it? Why do we conduct survey research? And that is so that we can use it for quality improvement. Um, and I think that's something that's applicable to most of you. Maybe you do have some, some compliance surveys as well. I think, I think everyone does. But uh, a lot of the surveys I do are yearly surveys that either are measuring something that's changed, a big initiative that's been implemented, or um, it's just um, a year-on-year -year, uh, improvement measure to, you know, to evaluate the direction of, our, of their programs, of their services. Um, so many, many research projects are about change over time and not just about uh, um, Inventing, reinventing the wheel each time. So if you develop a survey for your project here, with um, you can reapply that, maybe make some changes based on your findings to ask um, even better questions or follow-up questions, more detailed questions for next year. Um, so you can get at um, the, the experiences that your respondents are having with your services. And so how this presentation flows, I'll talk a little bit about survey theory. Um, I'll get into concept mapping, which is what I do before I um, even think about putting together questions. A little bit about survey validity and reliability to ensure that we're, the information that we're getting is actionable and that we can use um, in our analysis portion of our work. Um, and this is particularly important with respect to eligible population, both at the survey wide level and then eligible population by questions. Um, and that's where we get into gate and branch questions, which are those which guide eligibility within the survey. Um, answer choices, where I'll be talking about um, the scales that we can use to, to prompt um, respondents to give consistent information. Survey flow, which adds to, um, which reduces survey burden for the respondent, makes it more likely to complete the survey in full. Uh, visual rep rep uh, representation, visual presentation, um, which also reduces respondent burden. Um, we'll go through a brief exercise that I mentioned, and then we'll think a little bit about data collection um, before um, we get into some conclusions. And so when I'm uh, thinking about survey design, and this is um, based on the introduction, you know, how is sort of visual representation of the of the introduction that I took you through, you know, I'm mapping concepts, I'm going, I'm creating questions, 
um, along the way, I am also, you know, thinking about answer choice scales. But at the same time, you can see that data collection is all the way down there in the bottom right. So I'm not even thinking about um, how much data I'm going to get, um, what I'm going to do necessarily with that data. I'm thinking strictly about designing the best survey product that I can. Um, and then the last thing that I do is release the survey. So uh, lots of, port lots of uh, different small subtopics to think about before we even release the survey into the field, since once we do, um, if we need to make a change, it reduces the reliability and the validity of the survey. Okay, and so survey theory and managing behavior. Um, and since I know that we've all taken a lot of surveys, any, I think any of us have taken probably, I think I read a statistic where the average person takes about 20 surveys a year, and that's only a small portion of the number of surveys they get prompted to take. So we all have um, an intuitive grasp about what a good survey is, because you remember a survey that you completed quickly, it was easy, you didn't get frustrated in the middle. And then some other surveys where you really wanted to participate, you had some feedback that you wanted to give, but maybe the right questions weren't asked, or maybe there was some technical glitch and you couldn't finish it. Um, and unfortunately, that means that the, uh, the researcher didn't get the feedback that he or she needed to um, you know, create a quality improvement plan for their given services. So some of the problems that I, I came up with when I was putting together this slide are here. Um, I'm always interested in hearing about some, some of the th issues that you've encountered, so feel free to uh, add some to your own list. But I think that one thing that's overlooked, um, since you know, you know so much about your services, you know, you know about your work, um, but it's just one of a lot of things that your respondent is thinking about. So they'll get a survey um, by email, they click on a link, but they're also eating lunch. They're also on a phone call. They're doing other things. So it's not necessarily at the top of their mind. Um, so a lot of what does the survey design is, is to prompt that person to think about the experience um, and to take them back to that time. Um, now, of course, sometimes they will just forget and that's okay. Um, that's why we have our gate questions to, to remove their eligibility from the survey. Um, respondents will always interpret questions in different ways. Um, there are ways of managing that, but we have to understand that um, although we have our, our technical methods to reduce the different ways that people can interpret questions, that there is going to be some variability. Um, so a survey that I take this week um, may I, I may answer it slightly different next week when I re-remember uh, an experience I had or I think about the language in a different way just because I the first time it hit me I wasn't thinking about it as clearly. So I, it's important to realize that there the methods that we're using that we're employing here to get the most valid and reliable data are best, best practices but they're not necessarily um, solutions, perfect solutions to the problem and so many of the things that uh, you know, I've talked to you individually about about some of your projects. Those are those are problems that are encountered by every researcher, and uh, there are methods to mitigate those problems. But at the end of the day, um, we're implementing best practices and getting as much and most valid the most valid feedback that we can. Um, another thing that happens with respondents is that just depending on where you put the question in the survey, um, you might get a different answer. Um, they'll. Be, and that's partially because um, people tend to answer more positively at the beginning of the survey compared to the end, but it's also because um, they've been primed to think about a situation that they answered in the previous question. Um, so to, to, and that's part of why you're moving the, the respondent's attention from one concept to another within the survey. And there are some techniques, I actually didn't talk too much about this in this presentation because I don't use it that much, you can randomize question order in some survey platforms and survey um, answers. But typically I like to actually um, run the survey first without any sort of randomization and then um, do an analysis to find out whether there is a, a recency effect or a, uh, a larger problem with ordering questions within the survey where I'm getting um, some, some obvious statistical bias. And then when I, if I'm able to determine that there is, I can use some randomization in my next iteration of, of the survey release in the next year. 
So that's something that I would cover, um, not necessarily in this presentation, but in the third presentation that's about quantitative analysis, or I can answer some questions about that at, at the end if you like as well. Um, and then a few more problems. And this is something where web surveys really come into play um, as a helpful technique. Um, so respondents will skip a question if they're allowed to. Um, they'll, if they don't want to answer a question, if they don't, if they're distracted, they hit the wrong, uh, they hit the wrong button, they'll, they'll go forward and, and skip the question, but you can program a web survey to stop that from happening. Now, of course, you may also want to allow them to skip a questions and there are certain circumstances where that is actually best practices and I'll cover that a bit in a bit as well. Um, respondents will choose contradictory answers. So if you give them the opportunity uh, to answer uh, similar questions about the same concept, um, even if it's a 10 minute difference, you might get a slightly different answer than you did the first time that you asked the question. So best practice really here is to um, keep all of your concept, sorry, all of your questions related to the same concept in the same part of the survey, so you're not tempting the respondent to give you a vastly different answer. Um, respondents will answer questions while thinking about a different service. Um, and there's a, I'll talk about expository text in this presentation, which is a helpful tactic to reduce that phenomenon. Uh, respondents will fail to complete the survey and um, they'll provide feedback that is not necessarily actionable. So, of course, we want feedback from our, our respondents, from, our, from those who have interacted with us, uh, with our services. But at the same time, we want to limit that feedback to, to uh, feedback that is useful for us for, for quality improvement purposes. If it's something, um, if we're prompting respondents to answer about the service that we can't necessarily change or, or um, prompting suggestions that we can't really act on, um, we you know where it's not the best use of our survey space and uh, there are other uh, techniques that we can use um, to evaluate um, more specific requests. And I'll get into that when I talk about write-in questions. And so really, um, to summarize what I'm talking about when I'm talking about survey theory, it's to generate a predictable survey experience for everyone. And the once you do that, you've already, you've really already answered the questions about validity and reliability. Um, so if you're already thinking about how to get survey respondents the same experience, you're already off to a good start before you think about those two concepts. And so for survey validity, we're talking about what does the, what does the survey measure and does the survey measure what we intend for it to measure? Um, and so for the, the questions on the slide, uh, I have a, an example of validity first question being, how often did you find it useful to visit the library services desk? Never, sometimes, usually, always. And the second question, how often did you find the assistance that you received at the library desk to be useful? And so you may think that they're, they are similar questions. Um, they both um, talk about a, you know, a similar service, but at the same time, the second question is much more specific. It talks specifically about the assistance that the respondent got at the service desk, whereas the first one leaves a little bit more uh, general. So how often do you find it useful to visit the library services desk? If you're um, thinking about a student who maybe uh, you know doesn't know too much about the services desk, they might think that means picking up a brochure or, or just uh, reading a bulletin board, which maybe you're not so interested about. You want to know about the interaction itself. And so that's why question two would give you a more valid response. So specificity in your questions will really help improve survey validity here. And then for survey reliability, we're talking about um, a survey and how it will produce results if you take it a second time, um, and how a, and if the respondent is able to answer um, the question. Sorry, how respondents are able to answer the same questions and interpret them in the same way. Um, and so the first example is a good uh, example of a reliable question. In the past months, how many times did you visit uh, the it's a little bit. Oops. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit freezing here. How often did you visit the Petit Library? And so, um, I put this here because a lot of times I see questions where the time isn't limited, 
And so if a, res if a respondent sees that, they may answer about uh, a visit to the library that took place two years ago or maybe yesterday. So if you've had initiative, an initiative or you're really interested in something that has happened in the past semester, it's good to put that in the question. Um, so that improves reliability so that you're getting the respondents to think about a similar point in time. And then uh, for number four, the less reliable question, excuse me, on a scale of one to five, how useful did you find the weekly seminar series? And then the one to five scale. And the issue here is that we're not sure what one means and what five means. Um, and this is a, a common confusion that I, I see in some of the surveys I get by, by text message is that I don't know is one the best or is five the best? Uh, one being you know, the top or five being the highest number. So you can fix that by putting the description of the scale in the question. And that way um, you'll have a reliable response across participants, a reliable interpretation. And then before I get into a little bit more technical detail, I did wanna talk a little bit about um, sort of sur you know, survey-wide um, issues that have uh, that everyone is paying attention to in, in the industry. And then I hear um, from, from some of you that you, you're facing some, of the, the, some similar challenges uh, in your work. And I just put this in here just to show you that you're in good company, um, that, you know, that declining response rates um, is, a, is a phenomenon that everyone is dealing with in survey research. And so if you, um, you don't get 100% participation in your survey, that's not at all surprising. Um, depending on the survey that I'm doing, I get between a 5% to a 40% response rate. Um, and so the actual, the main variable that affects survey participation um, is actually age. Um, so the lowest participating people are those who are under 30 and the highest participation rates become, uh, come from over 65s. And I think that some of you have seen that in your own survey work where students are the least participatory and then professors or other professionals are more likely to fill out your surveys. So if that happens to you with your survey, it doesn't mean that you've done anything wrong. Uh, it doesn't mean that you've constructed your survey in, uh, at all incorrectly. It just means that um, you know, the phenomenon is why it is, is global. And that um, one of the positives with your work is that there may be more students or more visitors um, who are, there may be a larger population. So if you get fewer responses, it's not as big of a problem compared to with a professor group where there's already a small, a small number of them, but a higher response rate. And so, you know, response rates have actually been declining since at least the mid 1990s and probably since survey re research began. Um, and this has, uh, you know, this has consequences for the interpretability of the data that we receive from our survey research. And this is called non-response bias. So if there are particular subgroups and uh, age is one of them that are less likely to respond, um, then the, the data that we receive is, is less valid since we'll have an over, over representation of older respondents or really any, any subgroup that um, uh, happens to be less responsive to surveys will not be we'll, we won't get as much feedback from them and we won't be able to in, incorporate their opinions into our quality improvement research um, so it's, yeah so it's validity and uh, reliability are dependent on a representative sample and some survey researchers will use techniques uh, like weighting or oversampling to account for non-response bias um, it's something that um, you know is always up for debate in the in the survey research community which technique to use um, and whether it's an improvement even uh, an improvement over simple over standard sampling procedures um, to uh, deal with non-response bias. So for weighting, what you're doing, um, say you get a, a survey survey you get 300 survey responses, but you don't get that many responses um, from Latino respondents. Uh, fewer than would be predicted by their their portion uh, of the of the population. So what you could do is uh, extrapolate from that that tiny uh, subsample of Latino respondents and then weight it for their actual proportion of the population. Um, so some survey researchers actually incorporate this in their work. I think I'm seeing less and less of it um, because 
you're actually extrapolating from a very small group typically. And so the, uh, the error term in that small uh, subpopulation is very large. And so you're actually increasing that error term by uh, increasing their size in the, uh, in the survey results. And so I think a more popular technique is that when you're interested in getting more information about a subpopulation is to oversample it. Um, so many of you, I think, are, are, research, are surveying your entire population. So maybe that's not, not something that you can do necessarily, um, but you can, um, you can always maybe put in more effort or, or extend um, or, or uh, do some more marketing to get um, responses from particular subpopulations um, compared to other ones. And so one of the obvious ones that we do in survey research when we have too few Latino respondents is to produce the, the survey in Spanish um, and to encourage telephone use um, since we tend to get more uh, telephone responses uh, when, when spoken Spanish is used. And in that way, if we oversample a particular subgroup, we've eliminated the problem of the, the very large error term. And then we can incorporate that into our, uh, into our overall survey research results. And so the example here is just um, from a hospital services research uh, survey that shows declining response rate across years. Um, this one actually isn't too bad. I've seen in some government surveys a drop of 15% or more. And so there's um, some some <laughs> um, public knowledge about uh, times when non-response bias has gone wrong um, in survey and polling research. And so when I was taking, uh, you know, when I was starting out in doing course coursework about surveys, the ex the example that was always used was the the 1936 re-election campaign for uh, for FDR um, and the Literary Digest survey which was a paper survey, um, one of the first to, to measure um, pr a presidential election, presidential election preference before it was actually held. So they sent out paper surveys to all of their members um, and they actually found that Alf, they projected that Alf Landon would, would uh, narrowly defeat FDR. Uh, as it turned out, that was not the case in FDR won in the landslide as we, as many of us know. And the reason for this is that they're their members um, were not at all representative of the general population. They tended to be wealthier um, and uh, not a diverse group at all. And so um, that was the cause, this non-response bias that, that occurred because of their lack of planning to get a diverse sample that was representative of the population and caused this large error. Um, and then something I didn't know um, and found out recently is that um, you know, I'd never heard of Literary Digest. It's only come up when I've talked about this uh, this event, and it's because they they went out of business. They went bankrupt shortly after releasing the poll. Um, and so there was more some more recent uh, examples: the 2016 election, famously, and then also the polls leading up to the uh, Truman's uh, election. So it's a common problem that never goes away uh, in survey research. We just have our techniques to to minimize them. At least in your case, um, typically there. Um, the results, we're not picking whether, uh, we're not doing polling research, so we're not dealing with very small margins. Um, we're dealing with larger statistical differences that we can use for quality improvement. So we get a break there. And so uh, for modes of survey research, you know, I, I mentioned that you can also do survey research by fax, um, by mail, by telephone. Um, those all have their, their advantages. Um, but for web surveys, and I think for a lot of you, that's definitely the best, the best fit for your work. Um, some of the some of the nice advantages of web surveys is that um, you can actually send them through. Uh, you can you can actually send them by s. You can send a link by SMS. So sort of the standard emailing um, is actually getting to be a, an older method, since many of our younger uh, respondents and my and my research projects will actually prefer to answer surveys through an app um, since they don't check their email as much or to respond to a survey through um, a text message. Um, so one of the advantages is that you, there is some flexibility with web surveys um, in that um, you, can, you can use email to contact older respondents or, or text messages or 
uh, or app use to get to younger respondents. Um, the biggest one for me is that web surveys can enforce skip logic, which is not something that you can do through a paper survey. Um, and that means that the respondent will answer questions that they, they aren't eligible for and that you'll have to do more work on the back end um, to remove those answers from, uh, from your survey analysis. Um, another nice feature, uh, since I, yeah, no one wants to do large data entry for, for survey work, is that um, web survey platforms have data export tools. Um, the only issue is that sometimes they're not necessarily compatible with your data analysis workflow. And that's something that I'll talk about in the, the next series on Tableau, when I, where I show you how to take data from the platform and then put it into a form that's useful uh, and makes it permissible to, to use in visualization. And some of the disadvantages of, of web surveys is that web surveys are more likely to produce duplicates. Um, so if you're a, a respondent may get the, the link in an email, click on it, do about half the survey, get distracted, uh, and then come back and um, redo the survey from the beginning. Now, I have seen some improvement in this. Um, if they use, are using an up-to-date browser, um, it will remember their location in the survey. And then a lot of the survey platforms are doing a better job of prompting the respondent to go to the uh, go to the right question from where they left off to continue the survey. Um, the only problem is that it does it is somewhat reliant on the respondent having up to date software. So a lot of times when I'm working with with respondents who are having trouble. Uh, with a technical issue with a web survey. It has to do um, with an old browser or some incompatible uh, incompatible software that is uh, causing the issue. Um, one thing that's not necessarily as obvious is that you may get more negative, um, negative responses in a web survey compared to a telephone interview or even compared to uh, a paper survey. And this is because there's uh, the web survey is more removed from from human interaction, so people are more likely to be honest um, than when they're talking to, uh, when they're answering questions about services on the telephone. And that can be, you know, it, depending on your perspective, that can be that can be useful to you. If you're um, interested in feedback uh, that's that's actionable, you might want uh, a more direct answer from your respondents that you're able to implement changes to your quality improvement program. Um, than uh, if they were to give more blanket positive responses. And one thing that comes up more and more with web surveys is that some respondents, a subpopulation, this has to do with non-response bias, uh, are less likely to reveal information online. So with all of the information out there about, um, in, uh, about you know, phishing attempts um, and some fear about hackers, people are aren't necessarily, uh, a subpopulation of respondents aren't necessarily inclined to reveal information even about services that they've encountered, uh, uh, in, that they've encountered on a web survey. Now, I think a lot of you are at an advantage if you're emailing, um, if you're emailing people within your institution from a well-known email address or a listserv, that this is less likely to be a concern uh, for you. But if you're moving to, um, you know, sending text messages or other sort of newer methods of contacting respondents, this becomes more of a problem. And so to get into survey development itself, um, concept mapping is just a tech uh, technique that I use to think about survey flow. So I'm thinking here about how to divide services into their minimum uh, measurable components. So I'm operationalizing them. Uh, so from the schematic uh, on the slide, you can see library visits. I want to think about, maybe I want to think about how frequently or um, what days of the week um, they're visiting if I'm interested in volume measures or just uh, different experiences within a certain time period. Um, and so for, for, for library service desk visits, for example, you can think about a lot of things, the services that the respondent discussed, the quality of the interaction, what an unanswered questions that they may have after the visit, or what they would expect from a future visit. And so this helps to divide. Uh, so this helps to avoid sort of the temptation to ask the respondent a general question like, uh, what, did you, what did you think about your experience at the survey desk? And then allow them to write in um, a response or, um, 
to just give the or to have the temptation to just ask them for a, a rating from one to ten about what they thought of their interaction because on the other end of the of the survey research project you'll get a you'll get a number that says you know they the average number was seven out of ten um that they uh, seven out of ten in the sense that they ten being the their warmest feeling towards the their interaction with the service um, but that doesn't tell you what it exactly was as a part of the service that they were that they weren't that they really liked and maybe some things that could use some improvement and so that's why we use concept mapping to really tease out um, what components of these services are or uh, of these services that um, drove the drove the um, their overall experience Uh, I mentioned this a bit about the beginning. So um, one of the things that we think about when we're designing our survey is the population that is actually eligible to take it. And so um, you definitely, the, the standard one is to limit the survey to people who have visited the libraries the, um, bef um, before you actually um, prompt them to answer questions. So typically what, we'll, what you'll do in a survey is you'll ask them, did you visit? And then you'll skip ahead um, to the, basically to the end of the survey to collect demographic information about the group of people who haven't uh, visited the library. And that's so that you can know what sorts of people are, are not visiting your library if there's something that's preventing that group of people from engaging in that, uh, to, to, uh, to visiting the library. But you're not prompting them to answer questions that they wouldn't necessarily be qualified to answer because they haven't actually visited. Um, and so this can this can vary by survey. The standard one is have they visited the library. Um, you might also want to limit it just to students or professors, depending um, on what subpopulation you're interested in knowing the most about, or if you've tailored the survey to one of those groups already. Um, and then for maybe you're doing a follow up survey. Um, from a more general survey and you're more interested in learning about a specific uh, service from a subpopulation that you know has already interacted with it so you, that you're already limiting the the population for the follow-up survey by using the information you got from a previous survey and then you could also you could also um, actually limit the population to those who haven't interacted with your library to figure out why it is that they haven't and so in order to enforce this eligibility, we use, uh, we use gate questions. Um, and these are probably the most important ones in your survey, even though you don't actually look at them very, in very much detail uh, in the analysis portion, because they're used to weed out participants who aren't eligible to comment on a service. Um, and so we have our initial gate question, have they visited the library? But then another gate question later in the survey would be, how often was your experience with the library service services desk positive? And maybe that's not a, that's not a a, a, um, a gate question that you would necessarily use in your survey. But if you're interested in finding out about um, what it is um, the opinions of those who um, never had a, a positive response, you can branch that uh, th that group of people into a series of questions to learn about the negative response. Or if they answer sometimes, usually, and always, you can branch them into another series of questions to get their to get their opinion about services in a different way. And so um, the branch questions help you to manage uh, subpopulations who, uh, of eligibility within the survey itself. And so it's also um, about managing survey flow, but it's also, I think, helpful for the survey design team to think about how to divide the survey up conceptually um, to create breakpoints within the survey itself. So I think it helps the design, the design team as well. Um, and yeah, this is an example um, from the, the, the exercise that I've, I've put together of a branch question. So. I'm asking which survey do they plan to use in the, uh, to use when they visit the library, um, and then if they select none of the above, it's both a gate and a branch question because it skips the following question um, that asks more about um, the survey they the, the software that they plan to use in the library, um, and while uh, and also gates so it, it's 
if they click on the above, um, it skips over the, that question. And then for the branch question, if they ask, if they uh, pick Tableau or R, you could theoretically ask them um, questions specifically about those pieces of software and why they want to use them. And one, you know, one underutilized technique, uh, I think, in survey research that uh, I think is actually important is expository text. Um, so there's no rule that the only text in the survey that you use has to be in the question itself. And so expository text happens outside of the question text itself, often at the beginning of a section uh, that leads to uh, questions about a specific service. And it typically follows, uh, it also typically follows a gate question. Um, and it has to do with drawing the, um, the respondent's attention to a specific service to remind them that they are only to, to answer about uh, this specific service or this specific experience. Or you could just use the expository text to say that in the following section, um, the scale will be the one to five scale with five being uh, most satisfied. So those are the two main uses, I think. Um, and this helps, you know, it helps to avoid repetitive text. If you say in this section and then you split it up on the same web survey page, the respondent will orient to that and uh, will be able to answer consistently across those questions. Um, and that way you have a more reliable and a more valid survey. And for answer choices, and this is um, something that comes up a lot when when talking about creating questions, just because there's so many different answer choice scaling, uh, answer choice scales out there. Um, for gate questions, you're typically working with uh, a yes, no question, uh, a, fre a frequency question that I, uh, a frequency scale that I typically use is never, sometimes, usually, always. Um, other people will use the zero times, one times, three times, or more. And I think both are, are valid, but the key here is to use it consistent to use it consistently um, within the survey itself. Because research has shown that if you use more than one type of um, one type of scale within a survey, that you're more likely to get um, contradictory responses or or answers that are difficult to determine uh, to 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 interpret. And so I don't necessarily mean that you have to use the exact same uh, scale within the survey. So if you have a frequency question and an intensity question, you're going to have to use a different scale. I just mean within the type of answer choice scaling, um, you should use the same, uh, you should use the same scale. Um, so yeah, in a survey, either stick to never, sometimes, usually, always, or stick to the times method. Um, and one of the one under, I think another underutilized tactic, and this I'll get to this in the in the quantitative uh, the quantitative analysis portion, which is the third uh, lecture in the series. Um, and that's we can actually use what we think about answer choices in detail because we actually use a cross tabs analysis to um, tease out um, the preferences of the people who have answered a certain way. So uh, this has to do with the, the branching questions that I, answer, that I talked about earlier. So we can look at, uh, so cross tabs analysis is when you have um, you're comparing the answer, the subpopulation that answered a certain way in one question and their responses in, a, in another question. So the number of people, the people who answered never for a question, what was their response on a question about another library service? Is there something specific about people with that opinion that we can learn about in, uh, in the survey? Um, and then for other types of scales, um, you know, I prefer to use scales with fewer, uh, with actually less fine uh, detail. So prefer three, four, or five point scales. And that's because at more than five points, respondents have difficulty understanding, or at least um, conceptually dividing up in their mind, um, very fine scales. And five tends to be the limit. So the the most uh, fine scale I'll use is the strongly disagree to strongly uh, agree scale that you see on the slide. Of course, there's an exception. You know, a lot of surveys will use a one to scale, a one to 10 scale. Um, and that's since, and that's because uh, people do have an intuitive grasp about what a numeric scale is. So you're likely to get a, a pretty reliable answer. Um, there's also the option to actually allow the respondent to rank choices, which I think I've seen in some of you 
excuse me, in some of your surveys. And I think that works really well. Um, so in this type of question, you might be listing um, all of the services in your library and then asking the respondent to order them in terms of importance um, in their, from their perspective. And this way, you're actually you're actually shortening the survey itself and getting an intensity measure at the same time. So I think that can be a valuable tool um, to to get at preferences with your survey without having to ask a, a lot of repetitive questions. Um, so I, I saw that and thought that was a good tactic. Um, and then another another. Um, question choice that I like to use is the not applicable, no experience or no opinion options. And that gives the respondent an out. Um, and this is sort of a, this is a subjective thing. If you, um, if you are not sure if the respondent is going to have a strong opinion about something you ask them, you ask them, you can give them an out. You can ask, you can give them the option to say not applicable or no opinion. And that way you're not forcing the respondent to give you uh, a response that they're not qualified to make. And then the, the write-in option, um, which can you can do in two different ways um, on its own or within the question itself. And I'll get into how to, how to do that in a second. Um, so, I, you know, write-in questions. Um, the first thing I ask myself when I am thinking about them is if I really need one. And that's because um, write-ins are, are a valuable way to get qualitative information. Um, but it's, it can also uh, lead to some counterproductive feedback that, that you don't find uh, actionable since you don't have as much control and you're not prompting uh, the respondent to, uh, to think about a specific service. Um, they may up, end up answering um, a question about a service that you don't offer or, uh, or about, um, uh, or to just provide in general feedback that you can't use. And so one, one way around this is to uh, have the write-in be a, uh, a catch-all that is the, the fifth option or the last option in a question where if you give, you prompt them with all of the choices that you think should be available. But um, if the respondent has a strong opinion, they can add in their own write-in option. So that's a good compromise. But of course, many times it is absolutely necessary to get qualitative feedback. Um, and in that case, um, there's, there are ways of coding those answers so that you can get themes um, that you need out of it um, and to use that for quality improvement purposes. So I definitely don't want to discourage write-ins. I just think it needs to be something that's thought out um, before you, you add it into your survey because it, could, it, could, it, could, it can actually derail your survey and lead to some feedback that, um, that you can't use. And so for, for coding write-in answers, what, um, um, what's helpful is to think about the themes that may, uh, may come out in a write-in answer before you actually release the survey. Um, so you might uh, think about, um, you know, it's about a seminar series, which maybe is difficult to um, get feedback with specific questions. You just want some general feedback. Um, you can code. Uh, you can think about, well, actually the frequency is, is one of the theme, themes that I'm interested in learning about. Um, this, the space itself where the seminar theory, the, the seminar series is held is another theme. Um, so if you have those themes in advance, that will help you when you get your responses uh, to both to see if your question um, landed, if, you, if, if the respondents are thinking in the same way as you, or um, if, if you need to retool for the next survey. Um, and so the other way we think about it is is in terms of sentiment analysis and the intensity of the response. So whether it's a if the uh, if this if the response is um, negative or positive, and um, how negative or positive. And so typically when I'm uh, coding these answers, it's with two blind survey coders who haven't designed the survey. Um, but who know the themes. And so they go through each of the right and responses, code the theme and the sentiment, and then um, we see what kind of concordance we can get from that coding. Um, and then you can also just use uh, a descriptive analysis um, for, for responses that don't necessarily fit into a theme. Um, and then from that answer, you can still do some further research into 
um, maybe some some portion of the ser of the services that you offer that you hadn't thought about when doing the survey development work, um, or you can retool your questions for the next survey based on that feedback. And so one you know one question type that I uh, I like to use. Um, to reduce survey burden is the matrix of the side-by-side -side question. This is one of the visual methods that you can use to um, guide flow through your web survey. And um, you know, in certain cases, this can't be used um, uh, for for compliance reasons. Um, but when you can use it, I think it's a valuable tool. And this is just when you're asking the same question about uh, a variety of services, and you want a uh, and you're using the same scale for all of them. And if you're not able to use this particular format, um, there is a backup you can uh, that also reduces the amount of uh, space that's taken up. And you can just use sub questions for each of the services that you're interested in, and then put expository text below the question itself that explains that the the scale is the same for each of them. So I think both of those are good options. I alluded to this earlier, but um, for answer choice ordering, um, typically in my surveys, I actually start with the most negative choice first, um, since the quality improvement um, uh, specialists that I work with are actually interested in getting feedback uh, that's um, that they that they can act on, and so if they get um, uh, if they get more. Uh, if they do get more negative responses, they have a better case to, to change something um, in their existing processes, since there is a recency bias for uh, for or order choice. But that's that's definitely a stylistic choice. Um, it's a subjective choice. Um, so I don't necessarily advocate um, uh, changing the ordering within the survey or having a preconceived uh, idea about how the ordering should be, except that it should be consistent across the survey, of course. So you should keep, um, if, if it's listed this way in one question, you shouldn't flip it for the, for the next question. Um, that's the only advice that I would give for the initial survey. But if you find an effect where you're getting more uh, uh, answer choice ones picked in your survey, that's something you can work on for your, for your next survey and think about randomizing your choices. And then, of course, my favorite uh, is enforcing skip patterns in, uh, in web surveys, which I uh, alluded to. And the, the advantage here is it reduces the amount of time needed. Um, it, limits, it limits question eligibility to those who are only qualified to answer the question. Um, and so you can do this a number of ways. You can literally uh, force the respondent to go to the question after the one that they're not eligible for. Or you can also just add an NA choice. Um, it has the same impact um, as a skip pattern by giving them an out uh, and not forcing them to answer the question. And so I did want to do, oh, I think I got, did I get a question that I didn't see? Let me just. Uh, you did. This is Claire. Um, I just put it in, but in the previous slide, when I'm in a public area, so um, this is Claire. So in the previous slide for for choice ordering, um, the middle uh, selection was neither agree nor disagree. And would you, if you really wanted to understand if people had used a service or not? Should you put in something like a does not apply to make sure that you pull that out? Or, or would it not really be worthwhile because people might not understand what that is? So you're not going to get that information that way. Yeah, I think. I mean, that's that's a good question. I think. I think the choice here is, actually. I mean, I found out recently actually that some of the some people don't have access to to skip logic necessarily in their survey research. So in that case, I think you do want to add the not applicable um, option to your questions. But if you're enforcing skip logic, um, you probably don't need the NA choice as much, it, and it does depend on your population. If you have if you have a population that's sort of wary of answering surveys, um, or is nervous about the about providing answers, you might want to give them the out with the NA choice. On the other hand, if you know that that survey population knows about this service. Um, and you want to force them to answer the question, you might actually want to leave off the NA. So I think it's, um, I don't think there's necessarily one 
exact way that you can do it. It depends on the tools that are available to you. So if you have skip logic, that's that's my preference, but it also depends on your own intuitive knowledge about your about the people you're surveying. Would would you ever actually put the option of I have never used this service? Or does that yes. not really okay. You absolutely can, yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, and I um yeah, there are definitely yeah, so I I don't think I got into this, but yeah, if um for some questions, like if you're answering about demographic data, um, you won't you won't necessarily enforce that uh, that um, that person to to answer that question. So you can put the NA option, um, or if you have a circumstance um, about a question, um, or you haven't already established in the survey that they've encountered that they've encountered that service, you can add the NA the NA choice if you don't want to be repetitive with the amount of questions that you're asking. Thanks. Sure, thanks. Um, so for the survey exercise, let's get the link. So for this, we're actually going to, I created a short survey um, that you um, that you can fill out um, where I've designed it so that there's um, an error in the skip logic or at least a, lot, a, a place in the skip logic that doesn't follow um, how you would think the survey should go. Um, and to be clear, the eligible population for this uh, survey is those who have visited the library in the past and intend to in the, in the next uh, semester. Um, and so that'll be clear once you see uh, the survey itself. Okay. Okay, I'm going to share the link through the the chat uh, for survey the survey monkey. So I'm sharing the screen with you that just has the, the PDF structure of the survey that I created. And so this is what it should look like when you encounter it on SurveyMonkey. Um, it doesn't have the skip logic in the PDF since that's uh, what I'd like you to, to troubleshoot. So when I'm doing my, my quality control for my surveys, um, I'm actually going through each per portion of the skip logic to find out if uh, I've correctly restricted the population to, to each question. So I'll give you a, a minute to do that, but in the meantime, um, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I'll see if, uh, see what questions you have, or then I always actually like hearing about survey experiences. So if you have, um, have had any recent, uh, survey experiences that you, you know, filled out from a company or, uh, or, or some service that you've interacted with, I, I'd like to hear it. And we'll go ahead and do it along with you. So here I was restricting it to those who visited um, in the fall semester. So this should go to the demographic question and it does. And so if they visited it all, it should go to question two. Will you visit the library this year? What if I say no? My hope is that it goes to the demographic question at the end of the survey so that I know I have some information about those who didn't visit the library. Let's change it to yes. Uh, 
and then I should get to the, the software question. So I'm interested in lots of software, so let's see where this goes. And then I'm interested in um, why. And uh, I did want to point out that at least in SurveyMonkey, there's an asterisk next to the questions where I'm enforcing um, the respondent. I'm, I'm forcing them to answer. Um, and for question four, I actually didn't enforce that choice because I didn't want to force them to answer why they're using the software since it's possible that they don't want to answer it. They're using it for personal use, although that's typically allowed. So just um, uh, sort of an example of using your intuition when you're building your survey. Um, and then let's try another choice. All right, I didn't use, uh, I don't plan to use any software, so I should skip the next, uh, the question about purpose for using the software, and it does, it goes right to library services. And then let's try another choice. The other option, uh, I'll just say, well. and so this is, um, this is actually the, I don't want to give it away, but I uh, necessarily before you complete the survey, but this is where the um, the error is. Um, I hit, this is a common problem with surveys is that they sort of, people forget about the other option. Like I do want to know um, about the software that I entered into question three, the other choice, but I've designed the logic, unfortunately, to go to skip over that question into the library services desk. Um, and so that's why we troubleshoot our, our skip logic. And then um, it's really the, the core of the survey. There's yeah two, two most important things, question during survey design and, and skip logic. Uh, and then the rest should be right. So anyone who answers something here, and then I do, I do actually enforce the choice here since I do want them to answer this question, but I give them the out of the no experience. So I'm not forcing, I'm forcing them to answer the question, but they're allowed to answer no experience. That's one of the, uh, one of the examples of adding that in. Uh, okay. And I use SurveyMonkey here, but um, one of the consistent things across survey platforms it's definitely skip logic. So you, once you learn that on one platform, it's easy on other ones. Let me just tra transition back to the check if there's any questions. Okay. So for, for data collection, so we've released our survey, we've checked our skip logic, and we know our survey works the way it wants, uh, we want it to. Um, just some, some tips about what, what, uh, what we're thinking about for data collection. We definitely want to set a, an end date for the survey, uh, something that uh, can, uh, can be forgotten when thinking about the protocol, is we don't want to leave it open for weeks, um, particularly if it, the survey is about a recent event. Um, event, a large uh, public event you've just held and you're getting feedback about that. You want to limit it maybe to a week after that event so that you're getting fresh feedback. Um, for, for data collection, of course, some respondents will likely fail to complete the survey and then restart it and there are ways to deduplicate. Um, so typically this, you keep the survey that is uh, the most completed. Um, for data collection, you do want to release the survey in a consistent way, so we try not to edit the questions. Um, it's not the end of the world if you have to edit it. Um, typically, a web survey platform will update it in real time. It just means there's a slight, uh, slight opportunity cost with reliability. Um, and then something that um, you should be aware of is that um, in, in survey research, there's always, if there's a write-in option, there's almost always some language asking respondents not to use any personal information, not to write their name, or any um, PII. Um, every once in a while, I'll get a survey respondent who, who enters their name or other um, financial information. We have to disqualify that survey since it um, removes their anonymity. And that can be, I think that's important. Um, you know, 
even outside of uh, my particular field of, of survey research that you know a respondent should be uh, aware that their their answers are anonymous so that they can be they feel free to give um, direct responses to your questions and then for technical issues there you may have a, a non-response bias problem if the, a certain portion of your population is uneasy with browsers or hasn't updated their so hasn't updated their software um, that's some some of the uh, small technical glitches that occur can occur across the way uh, of your survey fielding, but don't want you to get too bogged down on it. Um, if you have a small sample of 500 people, it's unlikely to be um, determinative in your survey results. Okay, so those um, we went through um, my survey design principles. Um, you know, a lot of these are best practices. So if you don't, if you don't get a hundred percent perfect uh, survey design structure, the results that you want, um, that may just because of the way that people are, <laughs> uh, the, the varied responses that people give to your survey um, and the various experiences that they'll have with their in their own home or at their desk or on their tablet. Um, and so you're just creating, trying to create the most consistent environment that you can. Um, so, yeah, my uh, my principles are design the survey so that you can encourage completion so that there's no um, so people don't get stuck in the middle and get frustrated um, and to guide them and be uh, forceful about managing uh, workflow for, through the survey. And I think that it's um, I think it's better to over manage um, a survey workflow and skip logic than it is to under manage for quantitative research um, to to get the most consistent response as possible. Um, using expo expository text is an underutilized tactic that you can do to, re to reduce the amount of text on the page, but also prompt the respondent to think about only the services that you're interested in them thinking about for that series of questions. Um, and then uh, just overall guidance is to actually start with general questions in your survey and then get more specific as you go on. And that way you, there's a logical flow that's intuitive for the respondent and then it also um, allows you to branch off some respondents to answer questions about a specific service and then other ones to another part of the, uh, another service itself. And so that um, that sums it up for web survey development. I did want to put in uh, this slide about the next uh, uh, the next seminar series topic, which is data visualization in Tableau for su survey results. Um, the next the first iteration of that will be on April thirteenth. Um, uh, to give you a heads up. And then the third one later in the spring is the, the data analysis portion. So we'll be doing a descriptive uh, visualization of descriptive data in Tableau, and then more complex quantitative analysis in the presentation after that. So in Tableau, you can expect to be able to learn about creating uh, dashboards with multiple vises they're called. So visualizations within one larger dashboard um, using descriptive statistics. Um, and then one thing that comes up is because survey platforms will export their data in different ways, ways to transform that data so that you can do visualization quickly, um, creating calculated fields in Tableau. So if you don't do the calculations in Excel, you can actually do them in Tableau directly. Um, the dashboard itself and the flexibility that with uh, drop down menus and how you can limit the visualizations to demographic subgroups or other any other variable um, that you have in your survey is a really powerful method um, to quickly, uh, to, it's, it's useful for sharing information with stakeholders in a quick way uh, about populations that they're interested in and, and also crucially methods to actually share the visualizations and the dashboards with other people in your organization who don't have a Tableau subscription, um, which uh, is, is possible. Um, you can share your dashboards um, with, with only, uh, only having them download a piece of software and not having them actually buy anything. So I will stop there. I think, okay, I have just a few minutes, I think, for questions. Um, so feel free to uh, ask any that you might have, um, whether about uh, survey best practice, web survey best practices or, or any uh, anything else you might wanna share. Um, Kevin, it's it's Claire again. So my other question is, um, what what do you think, or where is it in best practices about 
let it, reminding people to take a survey? Like, is it better to just send it one time? Is it better to send it at specific intervals? Um, um, is it better to not do that at intervals if you don't have the option to only send it to the people who didn't take it? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, I, you know, it you know when I when I do my work, we we typically do three to five um, email prompts, um, and we find that three is really the key number to get um, the the attention needed to get your respondents to fill out the survey and that there's diminishing returns after the third email wave. Um, and so the absolute best practice when you're doing survey waves is to eliminate um, is to, is to eliminate the those who have already responded to the survey from the next email out. Um, and that's good institutionally since um, it's sort of a reward for filling out the survey, right? Because they, they filled it out, they don't get another email reminder. Um, and that way you're more likely to get more responses, both for the survey that you're fielding at that time and then for future surveys as well. Okay, and then my follow-up is um, when you're setting those up or just when you initially deploy, is there a rule of thumb of like what day of the week is better? Like is Friday a deadly day or a good day and the same with Monday? And then when you send the reminders, are they always on the same day or do you try to hit that differently? Um, we actually try to um, not do the same time. Just um, if, if we, and since I do uh, surveys with large populations, the expectation is that um, people will have different time schedules and they won't be opening their email at the same time every day. So we'll do uh, a weekday morning, um, a weekday evening, and then one or two um, uh, uh, weekend reminders. So I think, yeah, I think that's, you know, I think that's a good point to vary your, your ways of interacting, uh, of sending reminders to your, to your respondents. And then is there an ideal number of questions um, and how many are too many? Um, hmm. I think that the, I found it with my respondents that it's more, it's about time. So a 10 to 15 minute limit on the survey is something that um, I won't see a, a drop off in participation. I won't see a significant uh, uh, portion of the sample that just will stop answering questions. Um, and I think, you know, I think it's more, I think you really, this is where survey design comes in that the survey seems shorter if there's fewer pages to toggle through, um, if there are fewer scales to, to think about, and if there are um, fewer uh, services asked about. So I think, you know, the number of questions sort of interacts with other features in your survey um, that reduce survey burden. But um, yeah, I think it's a good practice to take the survey yourself. And then um, if it takes you more than 10 or 15 minutes to uh, complete the survey, then you might think about reducing the amount of questions in it. So, Kevin, we have reached the, the end of our time with our colleagues, but I wonder if you would be willing to share your email address uh, so in case colleagues had a few more follow-up questions with you that um, they might reach out to you. Yes, uh, please do reach out to me um, if you have any further questions about the presentation or, or about any of the work that you're doing. So. I think it's sent it to everyone. There we go. Thank, thank so you, Kevin. And actually what we'll do when we share the recordings from these sessions, we can also share your, your email address um, when we do that as well, because that'll catch colleagues that weren't able to join us today. All right. So let me say thank you to Kevin. Uh, thank you very much for leading this workshop on web survey design. Uh, we really appreciate it. And thanks to all of our colleagues who participated today and, and joined us. Um, so thank you. We look forward to seeing you at um, Kevin's upcoming workshops as well as Margaret's. Um, and we'll get the registration information out to you um, sometime very soon. So thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Bye.